Coming up, what an excellent day for hidden howdies. What the hell is that? Well, howdy, folks, and welcome to Minute 44 of The Exorcist Minute, a show where we endeavor to examine, extrapolate, and excavate The Exorcist, minute by terrifying minute. My name is Lester Ryan Clark. And I'm Keenan Diaz. And we'll be your holy guides on this journey through what some have called the scariest movie of all time. Okay, so our minute begins with Chris saying, Oh my God, honey. And it ends with Chris walking down the hall, having just exited Reagan's room. Mm. So if you'll remember, folks, our last minute ended with Reagan uttering one of the more famous lines in the film, You're going to die up there. After which she peed on the carpet while staring our astronaut dead in the eye. We get some uncomfortable reactions from our remaining partygoers, and probably the most distressing and also the most right is her mother, who's not angry, not embarrassed, but genuinely frightened for the well-being of her daughter. And in this scene, mom jumps up from her place by the piano and runs to her daughter to see what's the matter. The other partygoers are still in shock as they continue to stare. Remember, we were able to break down each of their reactions in the previous minute, right? Take a look at their reactions here as well. Like Keenan said, whether these actors have lines or not, they've all made a conscious choice as to how this event affects them. And that is one of the marks of a good actor. I don't know what this says about me, but in shots like these, I like to focus on one actor, usually the one I'm not focusing on. <laughs> You're like, like no. game testing it. Yeah, I'm game testing it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, Go and break the movie. Look where you're not supposed to look. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, to, just to see, like usually the one I'm not supposed to uh, focus on is what right. I meant. Right. Um, just to see like the emotional journey, see how they're reacting, if they are reacting. Sometimes you might catch someone who's not completely immersed in the world, um, and that's jarring. I actually don't know why I do this. It seems like a bad <laughs> way to watch movies. Um, but – to be fair, I only do this when I'm a re-watching a movie, never the first time. Well, you know, we're actors and we're, we're you know, we're, I don't know how you consider yourself if you have sort of a mantra, but we're, we're low-level actors, right? We're not, mm-hmm. we're not stars. So like maybe part of it is our jealousy of these, we could have been this part. We could have been right. policeman number two or mm-hmm. the hot dog stand guy. Yeah. <laughs> so what are I they do, doing? <laughs> I could do better than policeman number two. Look at that guy. <laughs> Look, at, Look at that guy. guy walking around. He's probably reading cue cards. Sheesh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Neither of us are neither of us are a Chris McNeil, admittedly. No, right? Oh not, my goodness. We're not having dinner with the president. Um <laughs> yeah. Um, But yeah, all that to say, uh, the actors here, all of them are 100% professional, right? They are 100% in the scene. And actually, I really love what the astronaut does here in just a second when Chris gets up. Chris runs to Reagan and looks from him back to Reagan. And as Chris gets closer, you see he's unable to look Chris in the eye. He tries several times, but he just can't do it. And while I was watching him and pausing and rewinding, I was able by pure accident to also catch Reagan's Linda Blair's expression as mom turns her around and it is scary. She is looking at nothing, but she is looking at it with an air of demonic plotting. It's an expression we're not meant to see. And I say that and I know this is a movie and I know Chris turned her toward the camera for that purpose. But what I mean is that Linda Blair understood the assignment, right? She understood the assignment as the kids say, right? Mm -hmm. She understood that the camera sees everything and she decided she was going to have that face when Ellen Burstyn turned her around. She may not have necessarily even known that it was going to be seen by the camera, but she was going to have it on. She was going to be in that scene from every possible angle. Yeah. Well, thinking about how we got to this shot, um, it's a very heavily choreographed shot. So this is the ending of a shot that is about 50 seconds long and it's this camera movement from the door into the hallway um, Mm. that that moves around um, the piano to look at Father Dyer and then moves back again. So I think that Linda Blair would have had to have understood that the camera is pointing at her because um, she is, her choreographer, her blocking rather, is choreographed with the camera. So it had to be like, okay, the camera's coming in here, Linda, you have to come to the right and pretend the camera's not there because there's huge, uh, she's basically stepping over the dolly tracks. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right, Keenan. I keep on, I, I keep on having to check myself for maybe not giving Linda Blair the benefit of the doubt. Uh-huh. Um, I need to, I need to give her a little bit more credit here um, and, and treat her like all, all of our other uh, wonderful actors in this movie. Yeah, well, and that's a really good point, especially, um, you know, getting to the the next scene, which, which you'll get to. But like that is that's a very, very strong performance um, from this little girl. Definitely. Um, 
And yes, yeah, so what I said about, you know, remaining in character from every angle, having that character face on, right? This is also important in stage plays. I decided long ago that I was going to remain in character long after I've exited the stage because I kept seeing when I was in the audience, when I was an audience member, I would see actors exiting stage right, stage left. And right before they disappear behind the curtain, you see them drop their character and just like walk off like a normal person um, because they think no one is paying attention to them anymore. Just like they think no one is paying attention to them if they're not talking, even though they're up on stage or, you know, uh, in front of a camera. So <laughs> that was a thing that I saw when I was younger and I decided, oh, no, 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 I will not do that. I will, I will walk off in character and I will remain in character until I'm back in the green room. Uh, are you uh, any any high school actor friends of, the, of yours that you want to call out for doing that? E- no. Ian Hinden? Absolutely Our no. friend Ian Hinden? Uh, David Zobel? <laughs> what? <it> David Zobel? <laughs> no, none of these people do that. All of these people are professionals. <laughs> Clint Goldstein? Oh, my God. <laughs> Clint Goldstein, John Wyckoff, if you're, if you're listening. No, I'm not talking about any any of you. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm not talking about any specific high school plays that I may not have been cast in and that I <laughs> and that I and that I bought a ticket to and I rage watched from uh from the back of the theater and just grumbled about this these cunting actors. <laughs> And any chandeliers that might have fallen, that was definitely not me. <laughs> You're right. no, the the no. angel of theater. That's kind of <laughs> the, the angel of theater, angel. So much lamer than the angel of music. I don't know. It's just like <laughs> this doesn't quite match that. No, yeah. no. Instead of singing, he just um, he just improvises all the time. <laughs> right, he's always wearing like magical costumes mm-hmm, <laughs> to mm-hmm. math class. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and the angel of high school theater, he he does not have a mask that covers half of his face. Because why would you want to cover his face? No. <laughs> it should be seen. His face his face is fully exposed. Yes. <laughs> he runs down the halls singing his own theme song. In the mag- in the magical um and for, for, for other folks in the in the Renaissance Fair costumes. Oh goodness. I yes. didn't know magical was like a, a vocab term, but yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Only us uh, 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 theater <laughs> folks uh, might might know that. I don't know. I I need to give more people more credit, mm-hmm. Keenan. I need to stop this. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Great. Yeah, he, you're a reformed angel of theater. Yes. <laughs> a- yes. Angel high school theater. Yes. <laughs> And in the in the high school newspaper, just a, just another review from the Angel of Theater, right? <laughs> Pedestrian, yes. <laughs> Obvious. <laughs> a bit on the news. Um, have you seen the Phantom of the Opera Part Two, which is called? Um, oh my God! Yes, Love Never Dies. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm, I I, yeah. I I saw the the national tour of that in Nashville. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was just so bored with it, you know, and just mm. and then at this and then uh, at the big climax, the emotional climax, I, I could see people. I you know I was I was not paying attention to the stage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was just looking around, me, and I could see people weeping. And I'm like, oh man, you know, I I I, I don't know. I'm just. I, it made me feel. It made me feel like I was watching it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, this is cool." Because it's it's the Phantom. He goes to Coney Island for some reason. Yes. Well, first of all, the Phantom is still alive. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Everyone moves to Coney Island, mm-hmm. like like by coincidence. The Phantom mm-hmm. is there, and Christina's there, and everyone's yeah. there. Yeah. And it's just really, really kind of silly. And but yeah, everyone was crying in the audience. I was like, "Oh, I'm just yeah. watching this wrong." I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and yeah, folks. Uh, <laughs> we fall. We've fallen into the <laughs> Phantom Trap. <laughs> The Andrew Lloyd Webber trap. The Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah, yeah. Good luck, Lester, finding some uh, royalty-free music uh, that fits that. <laughs> wow. Um, but no, like, I, I think, Ke- Keenan, did you read the book? The Family Opera? No. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, but you have seen, you you are- um, Just the stage show and the movies. I've seen like yes, three yes. or four movies of the Family Opera. Yeah. yeah. You're a film person, right? You know Lon Chaney. You mm-hmm. know- um, uh, 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 Claude Rains, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and all those folks. Um, so you would be familiar with uh, the Phantom story, uh, and yeah. I, so, so folks, anything we say about uh, you know Phantom Two, Electric Boogaloo, um, <laughs> this time it's personal. Phantom uh, Two, the Way of Water. Yeah, the, the, the Phantoming. Um, 
anything anything we say uh, about that sequel, right? If you if you have you know fond memories of it, if it you know if it was part of your of your your childhood of your of your phantom fandom, um, you know, it's like all due respect. Um, it, uh, it 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 came to us uh, like in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think because we have experience with the uh, the original story, I've read the book. It's it's one of my favorite books. Oh. Um, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Love that book. Um, and yeah, like we were very very familiar both of us with the um, with the original uh, musical, the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, um, which is different from the book. But you know, well, yeah. maybe we got to do a Phantom Minute. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just it was one of these moments where I'm like, I, I just like I knew that I was wrong mm. and that people were having like real emotional experiences, like shaking, weeping in front of me, which is, you know, the magic of theater and art, et cetera. Right. That, like mm-hmm. you, you could be such a bitch about it. And then two two seats away, someone is like so invested. Yeah, I will say, OK, like like getting a little personal here, like. I, I actually I never saw it like on stage. Mm-hmm. I saw it when I saw it right when uh, the pandemic was at its height and uh, Broadway was kind of like releasing, um, you know, uh, the show must go on that little mm-hmm. that little hashtag where they were showing all the Broadway things so that you could stay home and you could safely watch it and everything like that. So that was the first time I had seen it. Mm-hmm. And um, I had uh, uh, just broken up with somebody mm-hmm. and uh, it was uh, part uh uh, partly uh, to do with, um, you know, the question of kids and mm-hmm. things like that. And uh, uh, like in in this story, the Phantom discovers that he has a son right. and that like that, that kind of hit me hard. So maybe, maybe I'm coming at this from like an angle where it's just like, oh gosh, this makes me uncomfortable. It's like, oh man. Um, so I don't know. Um, every, everybody's, everybody's uh, reception of uh, a piece of art is... Um, What's the word? Subjective? Yeah. Yeah, subjective. Yeah, yeah. And it's gonna and it's gonna hit you at different times in different ways, um, you know, uh, uh depending on uh, the circumstances. Right. But yeah. With a cursed yeah. chandelier sometimes. Yeah, cursed, <laughs> like like a chandelier, head. it's just gonna hit you over the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love our high school theater phantom. <laughs> is that what Captain Howdy is? He's just a guy with a mask using a series of, of trap doors in, in the McNeil residence. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait, the phantom is not a phantom. He's just a guy. I guess I never thought of, Oh wow. As much as I was just saying how, how familiar we are with phantom of the opera, but I guess that that just never occurred. He's just a guy. He's just a guy. <laughs> um, no, captain, captain, howdy, the demon of the McNeil house. <laughs> I require 2000 francs a month. <laughs> He's just on his little organ in the attic. It's yeah. it's the attic because it's not uh, it's not the basement, <laughs> right? And he goes to oh my gosh! Now I'm now I'm just seeing all the parallels, right? Oh yeah. He is like, like I am your captain, howdy. <laughs> right. He can't. You know, no. He um. So our Christine Reagan can't dress anybody except for the angel of uh, high school theater. Yeah. <laughs> And everyone tells her, no, Christine, you have to work your way to be a grown up uh, in, in your own way. You have to mm-hmm, learn mm-hmm. things and and and, and um, you need to train yourself. He's like, you don't have to train in yourself, <laughs> Reagan. <laughs> <sighs> Instead of the mirror, it's the Ouija board. It's like, yeah, guy, it, it, you know, guys, guys, I, you know, I think we stumbled upon something here. <laughs> And in the end, right, she takes off his uh, his mask, but it was actually his face. She just rips his whole <laughs> fucking face off. And he has no face. <laughs> I am no one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. I okay. have a um I have a professor. So I do like Family Opera. Mm-hmm. I have a professor who's who calls Andrew Lloyd Webber the inventor of the one song musical. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Keenan, Keenan, that's not true. Come on, remember Joseph and his many and, and his coat of many colors. They were red and orange and purple and brown and something and yeah. Oh, gee. and don't you remember Jellicle Cats? Jellicle Cats or Jellicle Cats? No, certainly there are many songs in in Cats. Yes, yes. <laughs> that I remember. I don't mm-hmm. remember any songs in um, Joseph except for the main one. So yeah, yeah, Jacob and Sons. Right. Um, All right, let's climb out of this torture chamber. And back up to, oh my God, back up to, uh, what what did we say? Um, The upper, the upper, where where the hell are we? (laughs) 
Okay. Yeah. 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 So, uh, mom is, uh, escorting Reagan, uh, out of the living room and, you know, uh, presumably going up the stairs. So we cut from uh, the living room with with all the people gathered around the piano to a shot of mom and Reagan in the bath. But it's an interesting shot. We're not in the bathroom fully with them yet. We're sort of outside the doorway in the bedroom as if as if we're giving them some space, as if we're unsure whether it's okay for us to be here. Mm -hmm. Almost like like we're maybe we're Willie and Carl, right? We're like, does Madam need anything? Right. Uh, And we've come up to check if everything's okay. But we we know our place. We're not going to go in there. Mom is taking care of it. And then also it creates this weird, I don't know what you would call it, Keenan, but it, I kept thinking back to what you were saying about uh, the different kinds of zooms, like on your phone, like how at, at some point we're not zooming, we're just cropping. Mm-hmm. And it almost seems like we've cropped the edges off this scene with the doorway. Yes. Yeah, so Bruce Block is a film theorist that I um, I follow a lot and I'm teaching his work in a new class I'm developing right now, uh, would call this separation of the frame, right? So oh. about about what half of the frame to the right is the bedroom. And then, and then we have the other half is uh, about 50% bedroom and 50% this door frame where we can see Chris and Reagan. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. It, it, it does something to us, right? It's like, well, we want to be seeing what Chris and Reagan are looking at, but we're sort of forced not to have our full attention on it, right? Our attention is being competed for by this fish tank that I think is really pretty that we've never seen yep. before. <laughs> it's like got this pink light in it that, you know, that draws our eye. Um, yeah. The other side of the frame has like a lamp and, and we're looking at Reagan's bed and, and all sorts of other stuff rather than paying attention to what we want to be paying attention to, which is Chris and Reagan, right? So it kind of um, distances us when we really have the urge to get in there and, and know like the um, the dramatic part of the scene, which is the relationship between the mother and daughter, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and I'm, I'm realizing this right now. Um, uh, this is this is not Chris's room. This is Reagan's room. Reagan's room. Mm-hmm. This is Reagan's room and she has her own um, – uh, private bathroom, which mm-hmm. is really cool. We yeah. haven't seen it before, right? It seems to be something that that Friedkin has liked when we're introducing spaces. We talked about this with Father Karras's mother's, Mary Karras's house, where we think we've seen all of it, and then the camera will reveal more of it. There's a bathroom to the right of Mary Karras's bed that Damien comes out of we haven't seen before. So we think at this point, because gosh, we're in minute 40-something, 40, 40 uh, I should have been paying attention to you when you said at the top of the oh, oh, <laughs> of this oh. show, minute 44? 40, 40, 44, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're at minute 44. <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) Right. And we think we have an idea of what this house is. We think we've seen all of it. And then here's another room that we didn't know existed. And it's right to the left of, um, of where we have seen before. So this, this wall to the left of the frame that, um, has this fish tank on it is also the wall then with the, uh, the window that Captain Howdy comes through, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, the window. And, oh, my God. Actually, speaking of which, I, I see the – okay, wait, wait, wait. I oh. can't say – oh, fo- oh. Fo- folks, 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 folks. <laughs> what? <laughs> there is – there is. okay, okay. Uh, so the, the title of this, um, unless I decide to change it uh, after I'm proven wrong, <laughs> is uh, What an Excellent Day for Hidden Howdies. And oh. uh, that's because I spotted a hidden howdy in in, uh, in this minute. Well, and what is I a hidden it, howdy? So it's like I, a hidden well, Mickey, I suppose. Exactly. Okay. So the way that – you know, like for, for anybody who doesn't know um, – you might see in Disney films a hidden Mickey, which is basically just three circles, right? Two on top of one, you know, the the, the silhouette of uh, of Mickey's uh, of Mickey's head, right? And they have and them in I, Disneyland everywhere. They have them in Disneyland everywhere, right? Just little, you know, like like innocuous things that you know form three circles in that pattern, and you know, it's a really really smart, um, you know, marketing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, it just like immediately makes you think of Mickey, right? Even even if you're not in Disneyland, like uh, you know, you'll see hidden Mickey's, uh, you know, just like you know, uh, three bubbles will, uh, you know, suddenly collide and and they'll become a hidden. Mickey and you're like, oh my God, I hit Mickey. <laughs> I should give money to the Walt Disney Corporation. Yes, yes. So that was in some ingenious marketing <laughs> uh, by, by them. Um, but uh, as soon as I realized this was not uh, uh, mom's room, but Reagan's room, I looked and yes, uh, I, I see it here. Uh, it's not very prominent, but uh, it'll be more prominent uh, later. Uh-oh. But uh, it's definitely here. And uh, yeah. So so you're saying there's a Captain Howdy in this frame. Yeah, there is a there is a, up, I'm looking at it and I can't mm-hmm. I can't see this Captain Howdy. There is a hidden howdy. Um but uh and folks if you can if you can see it, uh yeah. Um <laughs> then then you are you are just as smart or just as delusional as myself. <laughs> so you're not gonna tell me where the hell this hidden howdy I'm not is. I'm gonna tell you because <laughs> It, it's, it, you'll see it even better in this minute still. It's in the same really? minute. Really? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, but it's in this frame. Yeah, it's in this shot. Well, this is infuriating now. <laughs> uh, okay. Where are we? Where are we? Uh, so yeah. So uh, now also before we leave this room, uh, we're noticing it's just a little 
bit disheveled, like Keenan said, right? Um, you know, the bed is unmade, the bedside table is cluttered, and of course, it's dark, contrasting with the harsh white light of the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like the detail of Chris still being in the party dress. She doesn't care. The dress is probably super expensive. She doesn't give two shits about that right now. So much so that she's kneeling or, or, or sitting on the wet bathroom floor. There's towels, there's stuff on the floor, none of that matters. And you know, then you think this this bath probably wasn't ready before they got up there, right? Mm-hmm. She had to draw a bath, or maybe Carl and Willie or, or Willie, you know, drew a bath and and you know, she had to wait for it to fill up. So she could have she could have changed then, right? But she didn't, probably because she was at Reagan's side the whole time helping her change, trying to comfort her. And I think she even has her high heels on still. Oh yeah. Oh my god, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point of yours, Lester. I hadn't thought about that, right? Because it's mm-hmm. in the rush of it. Yeah, she could have done a million things, but Yeah, right. Um now, from there, we cut to a shot where we're in the bathroom with them, almost almost like we're another parent sitting down next to Chris, and she has a sponge, and she's not really washing Reagan. Maybe that's all done. Maybe now she's just uh, running the warm water over her with the sponge, again, just trying to like comfort her. And this is scary right here. If you look at Reagan's face, I don't know how to describe it. It's this dreamy but also intense stare at nothing this uh, is sullen or despondent but it's also like not wide awake it's it's the exact opposite of that look she gave you know the camera when chris turned her around to to take her upstairs a couple of seconds ago this is frightening because it it looks like she's far away mm-hmm. yeah um, like she's it's like Oh, it, if, if you're in Chris's shoes here, it, it looks like Reagan has so much to say, but 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 she can't. It's not like it doesn't necessarily seem like I don't know, like she's possessed by anything. Maybe she is, right? right? But it, it still seems like a, a a person in there who just isn't isn't able to express what they what they need. Right? Yeah. Who is who is uh, you know they can't reach us and we can't reach them. Yeah, um, this, is, this is that performance of Melinda Blair that I think is just so strong, right? So yeah. again, she's a she's a tween. Um, she's relatively new to film. She's a model primarily at this point. But mm-hmm, this is mm-hmm. a, an incredibly sharp performance. And um, you know, later on, we'll talk about people diminishing Linda Blair's performance and saying that she's getting you know layups basically from uh, two other actors who we'll be talking about, Eileen Dietz right. and, and, um, and Mercedes McCambridge, who does some yeah. of her voice work, but. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is completely unaided by any of them. I mean, you know, this is yeah. this is a full grown up performance. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and then to compare the previous shot, which is very flat, mm-hmm. right? So we're looking perpendicular to the wall, and we have the separation of the frame. It feels cold and distant, right? Mm-hmm. Then to cut to this, which is shooting into the corner, and so is about as as depth filled as we can get in such a small space. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're shooting into a corner and it just feels a lot more um, like, yeah, like you said, like we're in the scene, like maybe we're not Chris, but we're somebody who's there who cares. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just like that, that contrast of, of starting it with very cold, removed um, against our impulses as an audience. And now here we're, we're putting ourselves right in the frame and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, we still can't help. You know, right, Reagan right. Is, is not able to let us help. Yeah, it's almost yeah, it it really is almost like we're the other parent, right? Mm-hmm. Sitting um, you know, alongside Chris and and just like hoping hoping that uh, you know, um that that we can help this girl. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, Keenan, when I was little, uh I I think it was in middle school, I had a fight with my parents and I decided that I was just not going to talk no matter what they said or what they did. And that's how I was going to get my point across in this specific argument, uh, just not talk and see how far I could go. Um, and it's one of those things I still deeply regret doing because I saw how much it affected them. Mm. Um, at first it felt great. I was finally winning an argument. I had all the power. Um, but very quickly I saw how much it affected them and, uh, that they were like suddenly cut off from me and that they couldn't communicate with me. And I, I couldn't, I wouldn't communicate with them. Um, like, like they had lost me. Um, and it ended with all of us like breaking down in tears and apologizing, but, but that's something I'll never forget. Mm. Um, is like you you take that away from a parent like their their access to you right and and we do it in subtler ways too i think like as we grow up we we just like uh we don't talk to them as much we don't engage with them as much we don't confide in them as much you know uh it's right. like what'd you do at school today oh, nothing. nothing you know what'd yeah. you learn nothing nothing yeah is there anyone you like at school right because in in preschool or kindergarten you run home and you're like i have a crush on this girl and they're like who yeah. is it let's set up a play. and then eventually just like i would never ever tell my parents that yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, 
but yeah. But that, um, that is the kind of thing I was thinking about here as I was watching it. So, I mean, thanks for sharing that story. That's incredible. You have that, mm-hmm. you know, this one distilled moment uh, where that sort of sums up the entire process of what it is to, to grow up. Yeah. And I think that's what we have here, you know, in drama with Reagan, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Hitchcock says like uh, drama is real life with all the boring bits cut out. <laughs> you know? oh. And so we have this reduction sauce of life. And, and yeah, so again, with I, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record because we say this so mm. much on this on this show, but like mm. e- the movie works so well, even if there wasn't a demon, right? Yes, like this yes. is this is this little girl growing distant from her mother, and mm-hmm. you know, being incredibly vulnerable and childlike in the bathtub, right, naked. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, I guess goes without saying when you look at it, but now when we have to like say it on the radio, <laughs> right, like yeah, yeah. naked and wet and cold and embarrassed, like literally and, and figuratively, like right, yeah. right, just incredibly vulnerable. And there's and there's still there's still something in her that makes her not able to communicate with her mother, right? Yeah, yeah. Like what else is there? It's all in your little tween brain. Talk mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me how your day was. <laughs> What are you learning in school? <laughs> We're reading Johnny Tremaine. Did you like it? Uh, <laughs> I thought it was derivative. Of, no. Um. <laughs> That's, I don't know if the Revolutionary War is really apt for drama. <laughs> oh, okay. Jeez. <laughs> Let, uh, maybe let's uh, go downstairs and make another dumb bird. Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that. I mean, oh, yeah. geez. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and no, Keenan, you are exactly right. And I think, I think, um, it's necessary, uh, for us to, to keep bringing this up that the fact that this would work so well, even without a demon, um, because yeah, it, it, folks, eventually we're going to talk about, um, you know, the, um, the new one that's coming out and my biggest fear. And, you know, it's a, it's a fear that I've, uh, you know, seen confirmed in other kind of like iterations of this story is how heavily that is how heavily they lean on the demonic stuff while not, um, you know, taking the time and doing the work on the characters, right? <clears throat> the reason that, uh, this, this demon is able to work so well within this story um, and be such a great puzzle piece to the larger story is that, like I said, and, you know, like Keenan has pointed out, right, all of these characters already have their own um, issues, their own baggage, their own, uh, their their own inner demons that they're working with, right? So you, and then, you know, you get, a, you insert a good villain who can kind of like manipulate those and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, put people against each other and, and make people doubt and stuff like that. But, you know, if you just, if you just have a screaming demon, um, then this is a, this is a different story, maybe not as, uh, as deep or impactful. Right. Um, and I don't want to say like, oh, you know, that's not right for every like I like alien without an alien Mm-mm, is interesting, but it's not yeah. that's not a movie. Them just yeah. just being the them being truckers in space is great and very interesting. <laughs> right. But like but like if if there was no alien, they would get home and everything would be fine. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. So I'm not saying like every horror movie needs, but but this one specifically, I mean, just just works as human drama so well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. About these these three characters. Um who are who are just going through some real shit, and then wouldn't you know it, demon, right? <laughs> like the last thing we need, <laughs> demonic possession, <laughs> right? That's that's the name of the sitcom spinoff. It's like, wouldn't you know it, demon? <laughs> and that would be that would be uh, Chris's catchphrase. Like that's the last thing we need. <laughs> and whenever Captain Howdy flushes the toilet, the the audience cheers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Captain Howdy, that's not very nice. That's me. <laughs> right? He doesn't. He doesn't possess people. He possesses them, um, and that's the that's the kind of like the little right gimmick. Gonna possess yeah. you. I'm gonna possess you. Look out! Uh, hey, everybody, we're all gonna get possessed. <laughs> Famous movie star Rodney Dangerfield. You know, because because they, they always have cameos. And stuff right, like right, that, right. right? <laughs> I took this demon to a dog show and it won. What? <laughs> you know that right? I was trying to think of a Roddy Dangerfield joke. It's the only one I can think of. You know that one? <laughs> no. I, I took last week. I took my wife to a dog show and she won. <laughs> oh, okay, right. I forgot because because Roddy Dangerfield is incredibly misogynistic and, and, and terrible. <laughs> But I was like, I was like, demon dog show. What? <laughs> I mean, Pazuzu sounds like a dog name, I guess. <laughs> Captain Howdy. Yeah. No. There you go. 
<laughs> oh god. Okay. 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 Um, so, okay. Uh, we then, uh, jump, uh, a little in time and Chris has already tucked her daughter in and she's about to leave, but we hear from the bed, mother, what's wrong with me? We then get a close up on Chris's face, mostly in shadow. Chris is just as much in the dark about this as her daughter. She hesitates for a moment and then she goes to Reagan. I like that we I like that when she passes when she crosses over to Reagan that we stay in the shot. We don't like cut to Reagan. Um like we see Chris's entire movement and the camera tracks her and we get this yes. really strange shot uh looking at the ceiling. Um yeah. that you know you might oh that we're not going to use that. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. What is this? But like it just feels right here like it is the kind of shot you would have in horror like again in horror or German expressionist uh, style or mm-hmm. film noir. Mm-hmm. We're looking at things in a way that we wouldn't necessarily look at in real life. Mm. So I, I like this shot. I think it works both for like the horror exorcist and and this just strange like drama where Chris is passing by and like, okay, is, is she going to be with her child again? Or is now this this other person who's taken over her child, right? The teenager right. child. Yeah. And yeah, from this angle, Chris looks um, so towering. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe I don't, mm, I mean, we could, we could uh, interpret this a, a couple of ways, like almost like, I mean, you know, your parents seem so, so big and larger right. than life when, when you're little, you know, you're always counting on them to save the day. Um, uh, but then also it, it is kind of like uh, scary. Like you were, you were mentioning like German exc- expressionism mm-hmm. and everything like that. Right. Um, and also it could be like now, every time I see a weird point of view, mm-hmm. I'm prone to asking like, whose point of view is this? Mm-hmm. Like who is that? Cause this isn't Chris's, this isn't Reagan's right. like who's, who's down there on the floor looking up like a, <laughs> well, like a dog. I don't know. Um, yeah, like a, like a dog who won a dog show, I guess. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so l- like Keenan said, we get this interesting shot where she sort of uh, starts uh, – where, where we are sort of looking up at Chris as she crosses. And then she kneels in the same shot um, at the side of her daughter's bed. Again, it's like we're, it's like we're with them now. Perhaps we are uh, the second parent, right? Uh, Chris – Tries to assure her daughter that it's it's just like the doctor said. Um, it's nerves. Actually, in the book, uh, she says nervous, which I really like mm-hmm. as a way of like you know uh, Chris trying to explain it to Reagan. Oh, the doctor said you're nervous, right? It's 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 this nice kind of like gentle kid way of talking about this, right? It sounds so much more normal and okay than a disorder of the nerves, right? <laughs> Your nerves yeah. are disordered, yeah. You do, yeah, right? Um, it sounds less like there's something wrong with you and more like, um, you know, you, you're, you're like, like a mood that you're in. That you're nervous, yeah. Yeah, that you're nervous, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that is interesting because right now we have uh, you know an anxiety epidemic in our generation and, and our students' yes. generation, um, and and we've started talking about that differently, right? So like uh, he's anxious, which I don't know makes yeah feels like a mood exactly. And then when but when when someone says um, I have anxiety, right? <laughs> There's like, oh, that's a medical condition. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, there is there is definitely like in the time that we're recording this, this there is a like a definite like uh, delineation between those two things. The same thing with like it's like oh I'm a little depressed or I have, I have depression depression right. right and that's like a that's that's like seen as a, a more serious thing right, right. And, and something you can do something about right that's the idea, right. right yes um, yes absolutely so I it's, so we talk about what Dr Klein said and this is where uh, Roger Ebert in his review of the version you've never seen says that the sequence that we have with Dr Klein that we've already seen right where Chris is in the waiting room and then talks to Dr Klein which was not in the original cut in 1973 right he, he said that is helpful because now that changes the entire tenor of the scene that we're looking at here where right. um so if we don't have that scene then basically she pisses on the rug reagan mm-hmm. and then chris says she's been sick and we don't know if chris is lying right. we don't know if chris is covering and then she comes up here and, and we learn that oh you've been seeing a doctor right which is one thing you know the the version in 1973 is a masterpiece right but roger Ebert says oh that's earlier scene dr klein is actually a helpful that's a good a good inclusion here mm-hmm. so now mm-hmm. when chris says she's been sick we we don't think oh is she covering is she lying we mm-hmm. think oh yes she has been sick she's been seeing a doctor and yeah. then we have here remember what the doctor said yeah you get this you, you get much more of a feeling of like team reagan against um this uh disorder it's like you got the doctor you got chris mm-hmm. and they're kind of like including reagan into it's like hey so the doctor said this and, and we're going to take these pills and we're going to beat this thing um so that we're all on kind of like the same side and it's not this um this like there's something wrong with you yeah and it's not that the audience is learning that here that mm-hmm. things have been happening that we haven't been previously like we've right. seen everything um we've seen everything that chris has seen yeah which actually 
like, okay, so to that point, right, we've seen everything that Chris has seen. Like, have have we seen everything? Like, does – so, again, I'm reading – I'm rereading the book. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm of course, you know, rewatching the film and I'm trying to, like, pinpoint, like, if I were a parent, what is the event? What is the instance where I say, okay, we need to get her to a doctor? Mm-hmm. Um, because – I, and maybe I'm just not remembering correctly, but like there, uh, like what is it, what has happened so far? That's a very good question, Lester. I think you're right, actually, right? That, that, um, cause it almost doesn't seem like, uh, like, like watching this again, I'm like, wait, we're at the doctors already? I think that because that's movie, I think you're right. I think it's movie logic, right? Like we know that she's, that she's possessed by a demon or something's going on to the demon. So we're like, okay, great. When, when she shows up at Dr. Klein's we're like, great, wonderful, smart. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think that anything has really happened. She's been lying about the bed shaking. That's the only that's thing the I can only like, I'm, thing. <laughs> like, like she, she, she shows up in mom's bed. Right. And you and I can, you know, like, like we, like when we were kids, we didn't like to sleep in our own bed. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. So like she shows up in mom's bed and then instantly it's like, all right, got to take you to the doctor. Cause there's, so, you know, like you got a disorder that like, that's the only, uh, you're right. I'm trying to think of other things. It's I'm complete think of, movie logic where we're like, yes, that makes perfect sense. She has an imaginary friend. Right. She says her bed was shaking and, and, uh, and she's upset because her dad didn't call her for her birthday, which of course she would be. But yeah, of course she would be, but like, that's not like, right. she didn't go to m- mom and say, I'm upset because uh, dad didn't call me. And then she said, okay, let's go to the hospital. Let's go to the she, uh, neurologist, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Like, like that was like, she, she didn't even know as we know, cause she, cause Chris doesn't understand that sound travels. Like she didn't even <laughs> know that she was privy to that uh, conversation. Right. So yeah, I'm trying to like it. Yeah. It must've been, there must've been other stuff that has happened that, that even in the book, they, they haven't like talked about like or or maybe Blatty just kind of like mentioned it offhand like that was enough for mom to say okay time to take her somewhere right yeah right but like also like the the noises in the attic like so so if we're living in the same house and my child says hey my bed is shaking and also in that same house there are unexplained noises in the attic i might i'm i might be uh, prone to think it's like, well, hey, maybe she's right because mm-hmm. like we haven't explained this one thing and this one thing could maybe be the cause of this other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, unless – well, maybe she's like, oh, maybe Reagan's up there like making noises in the attic and now she's saying her bed is sh- – I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like yeah, it's weird. Yeah, but, that's like, interesting. Yeah, I think you found something there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like it seems like the the conclusion of take her to a doctor happened a little too fast and it there must have been other th- – like this must have been going on for like a while mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and other things have been happening. Right, yeah. right. Um, so yeah. So Keenan, call me crazy, but I think there is someone else here. Uh-oh. Do you get the feeling that maybe you're being watched? Like someone is watching all this and smiling. Do you see it? I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying, I got this feeling like we're being watched and it's given me butterflies. <laughs> oh no. I see the butterflies. <laughs> uh huh. And, and this is howdy-ish? This is, I mean, listeners, before I, before I spoil <laughs> this to, for you, um, pause this episode and see if you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, are you back? Do you see the little glass frame in the background with the butterflies? This, this little plaque in the background with all the pinned butterflies always stood out to me uh, and the way uh, that it is unmistakably a smile, right? In fact, I don't think it's possible to see it as anything else at first, right? I think our brain sees the face, right? You were talking about pareidolia mm-hmm. before we even register what it actually is, which I really like. Uh, and I think, I think the presence of the demon is felt, even though we are still very much in the real world with real things, real dimensions. I would go so far as to say it's very much a Captain Howdy face, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Disney Disney has hidden Mickeys, and this this is a hidden Howdy to me, right? Because like you know the the, the framed white face, right, with the black, uh, you know, uh, with the darker color, kind of like around it, right? Right over, right over Reagan's uh, face there. <laughs> yeah, right over her face, right. Notice the positioning; it's right above her ear. Mm-hmm. Perhaps like it's uh, whispering to her, <laughs> and it's right as Chris is saying that everything is going to be fine. Just like the doctor said, the doctor knows best. Mom knows best, right? Just take your pills and you'll be fine, really. But good old Captain Howdy, right by her ear, he's smiling because he knows a little bit better. Um, so okay, so so I'm guessing this. This is not I've I have not convinced my co-host folks. No, I think that's good. I think that's very good. It it certainly is a face right above Reagan's head. There's no way to to see it otherwise. But it, that is a face. We've seen it before as butterflies. It's very recognizably butterflies. If you, you know, 
watch the movie like Psychopaths like we're doing and pause it, right? And <laughs> look at everything. We, we've seen this little um, butterfly thing before. Uh, but yeah, that is a, that's a little whispering face. That's the angel yep. of high school theater right there. <laughs> <laughs> you should have gotten the role. You should have been Goody Proctor. <laughs> oh, Goody Proctor. <laughs> You're pulling heaven down and raising up a whore <laughs> because it is my name. <laughs> you are combined with Antichrist. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Sorry, folks. I'm not bitter at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why you tried out for the uh, the crucible? <laughs> I did. I did. I'm, I'm piecing this together now. Yeah, yeah. No, I got in. I got in. I just didn't get to uh, be my favorite I was going to say, didn't I see that production of The Crucible with you? Yeah, and yeah who, I was in. Who were you in The Crucible? I was the lame judge. Um, I was I was not uh, the- You were not the, Danforth. I was not Danforth, who is played by Paul Schofield, who That's right. uh, listeners might ne- might remember. <laughs> um, but no, I um, I was- uh, Hawthorne? I was Judge Hawthorne, uh-huh. yeah. Who's, who's an uh, uh, um, ancestor? Is um well his um his descendant. That's what I meant. Okay, author, it was, right. I always get those mixed up. Yeah, his, uh, and and changed the the spelling of his that's name. That's what so I was going to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but they're the same. Mm-hmm, well, mm-hmm. I'm sorry that you didn't get. I didn't get to be Bob Cratchit in my uh, high school production of uh, Christmas Carol. Also, <laughs> well, Keenan, I think I think we have won this because we have this podcast <laughs> and they don't so there no some boy named chad who i had a crush on got got um bob cratchit so oh. chad if you're listening <laughs> here's my here's my 20 year late to confession of my high school crush on you Aww. and you were wonderful bob cratchit yes. that would have been better <laughs> 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 oh my god that 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 took me but i i took a sip and that was that was so quick <laughs> keenan regular oscar wilde regular burke dennings here that's what we need we need another section a drink with dennings um, oh yeah oh i just came up with that well yeah. he's dead uh, yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we don't get any more of him yeah burke is dead long live burke bye burke um <laughs> Right. Okay. So uh, we then get this shot of Reagan's face, almost completely in shadow, mirroring mom's face from a few seconds ago, right? Both of them are in the dark. Remember, folks, this is the first time Reagan voices concern about her condition, right? Mother, what's wrong with me? She doesn't know. She doesn't know either. Uh, Like I said, both of them are in the dark, Uh, but at least they're together in that dark. uh, And that makes the darkness a little brighter. Um, So mom leaves and Reagan turns over to go to sleep. Uh, One one tiny thing I noticed. Uh, she is a stomach sleeper. Uh, every time we've seen her sleeping, she's been on her stomach. Um, I doubt that's anything Friedkin or Blatty decided, right? Maybe that's just, you know, how Linda Blair sleeps. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I'm realizing now Linda Blair spends more than half of the movie in that bed. And I don't know. It, it seems like just another small way to just juxtapose current Reagan and later Reagan, mm-hmm. right? Later Reagan is going to either be lying on her back or she's going to be propped up on her back. And I don't know, there are there are logistical reasons, right? With the straps and everything. Um, I, I, I thought maybe this was an attempt to make unpossessed Reagan as different from possessed Reagan as possible, um, where they don't even use the bed in the same way. Yeah. What do you think? That's great. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a really, really good point. I love that. Yeah. Um, now, we cut from here to Chris outside her daughter's room. She's walking... Slowly down the hall, lost in the thought of everything that just happened. This is probably the first time she's been able to like catch her breath and really think about it, right? From the from the like before this minute started to right now, it's been like she her focus has been on her daughter. This is the first time that she like is is alone and she can be like, Oh yeah. That just happened. Right? Yeah, she's like carrying with her like her her shawl or some some kind of piece of her party um, attire that she hasn't worn in quite some time now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ah, but uh, we must leave her here with her thoughts, painful and scary as they are, uh, because that is the end of this minute. Um, Keenan, is there is there anything else we uh, we missed? No, I think we got it. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I think I am, Lester. All right, folks. Until next time. The power of the angel of high school theater compels you.
Hi, I'm Keenan Diaz, and today I'll be performing a monologue from Pulp Fiction by Quentin Tarantino. And I'll say my name is the Lord. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>